Pastor Wolf Mueller here. We just finished our worldwide Bible class on hope and its role in spiritual warfare. Paul says, put on the helmet of the hope of salvation. So we talked about the devil's attack on faith, hope, and love. A lot of questions about love and anger and how the devil attacks us there too. So it was a great class again this morning. Here's the video. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, enjoy it. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you can join us next week or whenever you're able. Future classes are fun to be part of live. So thanks again. God's peace be with you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Worldwide Bible Class hosted by St. Paul Lutheran Church in Austin, Texas. Glad you're here. Today's teacher is Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. We're going to continue. This will be part three of our topic on hope. The previous sessions have been recorded and are available in multiple places. They're on Pastor Wolf Miller's YouTube channel and also St. Paul's YouTube channel. So you can share those with others and catch up if you need to. We'll be recording today. Uh, we're going to turn off video to save bandwidth, and then we'll be monitoring the chat throughout the, the class. So let's get started. Thanks, David. Uh, God be praised for uh, your work hosting here. And if you, so if, if folks want to jump in and... Um, uh, and just and chat with David. That's probably the best way to get uh, to get messages over to uh, over to me as well as we as we work through this and as everyone gets going uh, and joins in. Uh, a couple of things just to be reminded that we're recording today. So if you're chatting and all this sort of stuff, we want to be uh, public and available publicly and so forth. So uh, you'll make note of that. And as we we'll work through an, a handful of our topics to begin with. And then, um, and then we'll kind of loosen it up at the end for questions. So today's topic is going to be, we're going to continue our study in hope. And um, we're going to focus in on hope and spiritual warfare. And if we, if we have enough time, then we're going to also visit the, the source and the object and the act of hoping. We're going to look at those three divisions uh, when, it, when it comes to hope as well. So we'll begin with a prayer. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you, has, you have given us your holy scripture for our learning. Grant that we might so hear them, read, mark, and learn, and inwardly digest them. By the strength and comfort of your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Oh man! Well, we got, I've got a lot of emails from you guys, by the way, and some uh, notes from the chat and everything else like this. So thank you for sending that. Uh, the best way to send stuff is the, uh, is the website wolfmuller.co slash contact, and you can get stuff to me that way. Uh, this email came last week. I just finished the second study on hope. My daughter-in-law and only grandchild were killed, oof, were killed in, a, in a car accident almost 18 months ago. A few weeks prior to that, I had attended a silent Catholic retreat, an interesting time. One of the questions was, how do we deal with disaster in our lives? Up to that point, I had not experienced anything I would call a disaster, but I prayed that day God would grant me the necessary strength if something should happen. He answered that prayer a few weeks later. My hope has become sharpened and is a living thing for me. This is how Peter talks about the Christian hope that we have a living hope, that we are begotten to a living hope. We'll see that in today's study. Those deaths have given me many opportunities to share my faith and hope. God provided many uh, silver linings, even in the midst of unimaginable grief. The first one being he spared my son's life when he did not spare his own son's life. There is no worse day coming for me anymore, which is not to say that I still don't mourn their loss deeply. And so I look forward to my hope realized. Come, Lord Jesus. Great study. I'll share the link. So thank you for this. This is really a quite, I, there's, so been, there's so many, uh, so many moving uh, things that we've heard, not only in the study, but from the email as well. I really appreciate this. And it, it, it's one of those things is that we realize that, that hope, it continues to press us forward. In fact, we're going to try to look at the fruit of hope as we, as we continue this topic of hope and, and consider that as well. And, and so we see that as well. How do we mourn? We said, Paul said this explicitly um, in First, First, Thess First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and following. He says, we mourn not as those who have no hope, so that we are mourn our mourning, even as Christians, is very different than everybody else's mourning. Our mourning is with hope. So, so thank you so much for this email. Uh, if you guys have uh, thoughts or anything 
uh, that you'd like to add, this is probably the best way to do it. So you can jot that down. And these slides, by the way, that we're going to look through, we got a lot of verses. And so these slides are always going to be available also uh, on the website, wolfmuller.co slash Bible. And you can just click on this and you can see, I think a bunch of you guys are actually looking at the slides at the same time. At least I saw that. So you can do that. Uh, you can do that as well. Well, we, let's, um, let's, uh, pr let's press forward just a little bit. So if you'll remember the topics that we've covered so far in regards to hope are number one, how our hope is unique. The Christian uniquely has hope. So God be praised for that. In fact, it's one of the things that we, that we kind of want to, we want to hone in on a little bit that Paul can say that the pagan is without God, without hope and without God in the world. And, and so the, as our world becomes more pagan or more secular, more pantheistic, probably, we recognize that one of the things that happens is there's a diminishment of hope. The horizon of hope, we talked about this last week, is shortened. I mean, it, it extends to my death and that's it. Maybe it lives on in my family or something like that, but there's no real hope for me pressing past death if I'm a pagan, if I don't believe in God, if I don't believe in in heaven, if I don't believe in the resurrection and so forth. So that the, one of the marks of the secular mind is it's without hope. And we see that just not only in what, not only in, um, in the kind of the news and the cultural phenomenon, but even in individuals that we're talking with, it should be that as a Christian is, is talking with someone who's not a Christian, we're like, well, there's some different ways that we think and that we live and that we feel in this life. And one of those is, um, is hope. We, that we have, uh, that we have hope. And then, um, and then the second thing we talked about is faith and hope and love. And the, one of the, uh, how these three are always together in this world, faith, hope, and love, uh, and how the Lord is always giving us all three. And we want to press on from that into the idea of hope and spiritual warfare. Now, I want to see if we can do this because I, uh, a friend of mine, Pastor David Werner, um, who is a, one of our missionaries in Spain, um, who I got to spend some time with this week uh, in, in there. And I thought, well, so we got a worldwide Bible study. We should try to make it worldwide. So I asked if Pastor Werner would come on and give us a few thoughts on hope and then also give us an update on how things are going in Spain. Is that something we can do? We're ready? Yep, we're ready. All right. Hey, David, good well, morning or good evening. Good afternoon and good you know, morning. So Carrie and I, we were sitting in the back patio and it was like 1130 a couple of nights ago. And we had dinner so late. I mean, we had dinner at like <laughs> nine o'clock because everything's just kind of crazy. And I said, it's like we're living in Spain now. You know? Yes, it is. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, greetings to everyone from uh, Cartagena, Spain, where I live here with my wife, Shelly. Um, I haven't looked through the names too much here today, but last week when I was on the study, I recognized a number of people from the tour number of names. And uh, so hi to those folks who've been here with uh, Pastor Wolf Mueller last June, I guess it was, and visited the mission. It was a great blessing for us. Um, and I used to just briefly, I could just say that, that we're doing well. We do have some, um, as you all know, Spain has, has not done well with, with the whole coronavirus epidemic. And we do have some of our member families have been touched by it. Um, Lord, Lord be praised so far, we haven't lost anyone. We do have some, some members and some extended family members of the church um, who are fighting the virus or have fought the virus. And uh, um, the lockdown here in Spain continues. It's been, it, was, it was done too late, and then it was done very extremely. Um, I, you know, we, we can go out of our houses very little. It's starting to slowly loosen. And uh, what we're doing as a mission and as a church is... is uh, what, what almost everyone is doing. Uh, we use Zoom, we use Facebook Live, uh, we text, we call, we stay in contact. Um, our worship schedule has stayed the same. Uh, obviously, we haven't been able to celebrate the Lord's Supper or, or be with each other, but uh, we're looking forward to that day, uh, Lord willing, not too far away. And uh, Pastor Rolf, I just wanted to um, uh, say how cool it was to be on the study last week and to think about the way you were working with faith, hope, and love, because it just really nicely helps one understand the context for mission and in particular the context for mission here in Spain. As I think most of you know, Spain is a traditionally um, Roman Catholic country. I think historically there probably isn't a more Roman Catholic country in the world, including Italy. Um, 
but in Roman Catholicism, faith is distorted. Their understanding of what the faith is, it's kind of semi-Pelagian. It's a salvation is a mixture of God's grace and our works or the works of the saints. And on that, that confusion, that distortion on the faith corrupts our love because love then becomes not good works that we freely do in response to God's grace to us and, and that we do in, in love toward our neighbor freely, but rather works of love become necessary as a part of, of the completion of my salvation. Um, so a distorted faith leads to corrupted love. Um, and that means there's no joy in Christian living. And I think if you study the history of Christianity in Spain, um, you, can, you can trace this and you can see how that's been a real problem uh, in a country that has been Christian. I mean, Paul was here um, by, by most accounts. Paul came here. Um, he wanted to go here. We know that from Romans 15. Uh, Christianity has been here for a long time, but Christianity has been very distorted. And with, with, no, uh, with no joy in Christian living and no hope, um, then, then in the end, the church becomes something other than what it should be, and the people lose, uh, lose their attraction to it. And so what's our Lutheran mission response? Well, our Lutheran mission response here in Spain is, is to preach the gospel. Um, that is the true faith. Get that out there. We proclaim it in sermon and song and in catechesis and in our liturgies. Um, and it is a great joy to share the true faith with someone who's never really quite heard it before, even though they've known about Christianity all their life. Um, we want to show mercy. We want to love our neighbors. Um, we are currently, currently in the midst of this uh, coronavirus crisis, organizing a mercy fund for our own members and for friends of the church, because we have a lot of people who've been thrown out of work. Um, we want to uh, teach our members how to show mercy, how to show love to their neighbors, give them good avenues for that. And then our third, our third priority is to plant Lutheran churches. Locally and nationally, Lutheran churches are the place of hope. Lutheran churches are the place where the faith is, is proclaimed and taught and received and strengthened. Um, Lutheran congregations are the font from which love flows um, because they're the gathering of God's people, his pueblo, um, the gathering of God's people around Christ in word and sacrament. And so it, because Christ is there, then the church is heaven on earth when we gather together. And, and our ultimate hope is that joy in heaven. And we have that, uh, that not yet, but yet still now we have that hope now as church. And so that is, is just so, it was just, as I was listening to your study last week, it was just so uh, fun, so fantastic to think about how well this fits with helping us understand our mission context, perhaps the mission context of, of everyone on the call as well, um, and then how it helps shape what we do here. Um, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, um, questions for missionaries are great. Um, if anybody ever has a, a question about um, the mission in Spain, I love to receive them. I'm going to put my email in the uh, chat here. I guess I'll, get, I'll pass it to David and he can share it for the, the right way to do that. I love questions because good questions make me a better missionary. Um, and then we do need donations for our projects. We, 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 we love supporters. I know some of you, I've recognized some of the names on this call are supporters. And so I'll put a link there, pass it on to David as well on, on how, uh, how that can be done to help us do the work that God has given us here. My email is real simple. It's david.warner at lcms.org. Um, but I'll put that in the, in the chat here in just a minute. And I want to thank you, Pastor Wolf Mueller, um, for inviting me on the call for doing this study. And if there's any immediate questions from you or from anybody else right now, before we head back into the study, I'd be happy to, happy to field those. Yeah, but uh, maybe, so you mentioned Romans 15. I just, and so we're talking about hope. And so there's this, there's this idea that hope extends past this life. But there's also hope for things in this life. So one of the things, we, I mean, when we were in Spain, we were looking at this. I hope to come to Spain. Yes. So, so Paul has, you know, we have hopes for the things that will happen in this life. And then we have hope. And, and those are tenuous. Uh, but we still have them. We still live according to these hopes. So it's one of the things that this coronavirus has done is, you know, we all have these sort of immediate hopes for this life. And then all of a sudden now we just don't know what they're going to be. How, so how, just thinking in terms of hope and what you guys are going through, do you mind just saying a couple of things about that, reflecting on that some? Sure. Um, you know, when Paul says that, then he says, when I come to you in, 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 in Rome, 
I, um, I'll come to you in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. That's where Paul went all the time into that full blessing of Christ. And boy, we really need that now. There's never wow. a better time yeah, that's perfect. Um, to be clear and joy filled and um, just explicit about the gospel because it is hard. We have a, we have a missionary, uh, Kayla Holmes. She's been serving with us for, for three years. Her time of service is done, but she can't go home. She's stuck. <laughs> she's in lockdown in Sevilla and we're trying to look to see when is it that she's going to be able to, to, to go home because the next phase of her life is starting. And, and what we're thankful that we can keep her working and keep her busy and keep her connected um, to the word uh, until this, this famine, until this famine of, of the Lord's supper is over. Um, but that, that, that promise that we have and digging deeper into that promise is so important um, now in the midst of, of this situation, because there's so many things we, we can't do um, that we would normally do. Uh, my wife and I are expecting our second grandchild and uh, we were headed home um, and now we're not. And we don't know uh, when we'll go home to, to see our family again. And we don't know when, um, when we go, whether we'll sit in quarantine for a while before we can see anybody. I mean, there's all these questions and how critical it is um, just to dig deeper um, in your daily devotion, in your, in your connection uh, to your home congregations, um, in, your, in your own reading, because uh, we need that promise to carry us through because because these are um, uh, very strange times and times that, 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 that are striking everyone differently. And then also um, to be ready to think about that opportunity um, I'm getting to know neighbors because we're all home all the time and now we're out and we see each other on our front porches and, and uh, um, people are, you know, there's opportunities to, to get to know people and there's opportunities to help people uh, that, that they haven't, haven't existed before because, you know, some people are passing through this very easily and, and some people not. And so uh, with, with the eyes of, of eyes enlightened by Christ, we can, we can see this. Um, as a hope filled time as well, where we can be sharing what we have with others. Thank you, David. Oh, man. This, and what you said about Paul reminds me. So he always, Paul had this two ways of being with the church, right? He said, I, I'm with you in spirit. He's writing to them, he's praying for them, he's thinking for them. And so there's this connection that we have, even over a distance. But then he says, I want to be with you. I want to so be with you in the body to be able to bless you and so forth. So that's. Um, that's right. That's good. Well, thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks for jumping in here, and uh, and My we'll pleasure. make sure that your in, your contact info and email is in the chat as well. So I will get that in. Thank God you. Be praised. Yeah, I'm gonna jump into this. I'm gonna switch to the screen here, and and press a little bit on to. Um, thanks, Pastor Warner, by the way, for not just for being on today, but for all the work that you're doing. It's really incredible. And say hi to everyone in Spain for us. Um, if we, Pastor Werner made this note that, you know, it's just it's to think about the life of the church in terms of faith, hope, and love is really helpful. And I think it's, it's also helpful to think of spiritual warfare in those terms. So let me draw you guys a picture because that's what really I know why you're here. You're like, we, we just, it's like there's, you know, there's such a great history of artists in Spain. And so now with Pastor Werner here, and we just got to see some art. So that if you think of your Christian faith, now the church as a house and your own Christian faith as a house, there's a front door attack, there's a back door attack, and then there's an inside the kitchen window attack. Uh, so the devil's going to mount three attacks on our hearts and our consciences. He attacks our faith, and, he, and then he, if that doesn't work, or even if it does, then he goes around back and he attacks our love, and then he sneaks around the side and he attacks our hope. This is, the, this is what, I mean, this is just how the devil does things. He's just always attacking us. He wants to destroy. If, the, if God gives us faith, hope, and love, then the devil wants to destroy uh, faith, hope, and love. So, so, so that we can just know this as we live in this Christian life, that these are the gifts that the Lord wants to live, to give to us in our life, and these are the things that the devil wants to take away. Now, how does he attack our faith? Just, to, just can, kind of consider this. I mean, he attacks our faith by unbelief. He attacks our, uh, he attacks our faith by despair. He attacks, uh, our, he attacks our faith by false belief, by false doctrine. 
and so forth. So that the devil's going to try to get us to doubt the faith once for all delivered to the saints, the, the truth of the scriptures, the truth of the gospel. Uh, so that's the first attack. And then he comes and he attacks our love. And how does he attack our love? Again, a multitude of different ways. But number one, he, he attacks our love by getting us to sin against God or against the neighbor when we break one of the commandments and sin against God and the neighbor. Or, and this is a really kind of amazing one, when we're sinned against, so that someone comes, now, now let's just uh, maybe just reflect on this just a little bit, because this is also going to connect to hope, but this is important, is that when I'm sinned against, what happens? I mean, I, I didn't do anything wrong, right? This comes up, I mean, a lot of times in pastoral care, is that if I sin, well, I kind of know what to do about that. If I sin, then I go and I confess my sin to God. If it sticks with me, I go and confess to my confessor pastor and then i hear i hear the absolution so guilt uh leads us to confession which leads us to the absolution which leads us to faith and trust in god and so forth so we kind of know what to do with our own sin but what do we do when we're sinned against and the result is not guilt but and casually here just call it shame what do we do when the result is shame it's it's a bit it's a bit tricky and, and what happens is, so I'm sinned against, I'm shamed, and then, what, and then I become angry. And this, is, this anger is really the devil's attack on love. Because what happens when I'm angry? And then I say, well, I, I know I'm supposed to love you, but you sinned against me, and so I don't have to love you. I've taken you off of my neighbor list. I, it's a, anger is a, is a kind of justified lovelessness. So that I can say, look, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to love that guy because he sinned against me. I don't want to love that person because they hurt me and shame me and so forth. So the devil is attacking our love. He attacks our faith. He attacks our love. But then he comes along and he also attacks our hope. And this is the thing that we want to, that we want to consider. The devil comes and he, and, and he attacks our, um, uh, the, the hope that the Lord wants to give to us. I think he does it in a couple of different ways. He does it especially through suffering. So when I'm experiencing the difficulties of this life, when I'm experiencing uh, hard times, and, I, then I, and I'm tempted to think that this will never end, that it's always going to be this bad. And so the, Lord, or so the devil tries to wear us down through our suffering. The other way that the devil attacks our hope is by fleeting pleasures. Does fleeting have two E's or is it an I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not a good speller, guys. I'm sorry. sorry. The, the fleeting pleasures. The, this is one of the marks of our current times is that as people are chasing after pleasure, this kind of hedonistic epicureanism, and we're chasing after, we're chasing after pleasures, and we realize that these are fleeting, that they just don't last. And we, so, and we say, okay, I'm going to pursue this because this will make my life better. I'm going to try this because it's going to make my life better. And then you get there and it doesn't. And there's this emptiness the next day. There's this emptiness the next morning. There's this emptiness the next moment that you think that the things that were going to satisfy you were going to bring the satisfaction and they don't. And there's an emptiness and you think, well, then can I ever get there? You're on this treadmill of trying to find some sort of meaning or some sort of value in things that have no meaning and value and pleasure, and it comes up empty. So that suffering and fleeting pleasure, and this ends in despair. This is the, this is the devil's attack on, on hope. So that he gives us, I mean, we're, you know, we have this in the parable of the sower. We have the, 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 um, the seed that fell in the weeds. That's the fleeting pleasure and the, and the cares and pleasures of this life grow up and choke it out. You have the seed that fell amongst the rocks and, that, and the sun came out and burned it all up. That's suffering and persecution. And this is all the devil's attack, not only on our faith, but also on our hope, saying that things are, things are bad and they are, they're never going to get better. They're never going to get better. So that so the devil is attacking also our hope. Now, the, the thing that I want you guys to see here is just to recognize that that spiritual warfare is 
is kind of happening on three fronts. And it's always at the same time. I mean, the devil always wants us to, 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 to be, be tempted to unbelief, to be tempted to lovelessness and sin, and to be tempted to despair. So he's always pressing on us. But sometimes the press will come harder on one than the other. We normally think of temptation simply, in fact, I would say that most of the time, when we, if, if we were to talk about temptation, we're normally thinking right here that the devil tempts us to sin. But, uh, but remember, even in the Lord's Prayer that Luther taught us in the Catechism, it would lead us not to temptation, that, that the Lord would protect us from, from, from any sort of shame, unbelief, despair, doubt of God's mercy. That, in fact, comes first. And then any other great shame and vice, that's the temptation to sin over here as well. So that the temptation comes uh, all the way around. All the way around. Uh, so there, so to, so to recognize the attack. Now, one of the amazing things that we're going to see, uh, and this is a this is a spiritual mystery that I do not understand. I just can see it in the scriptures. And so, if you guys have insight on this, I would very much like to see them. But it is this, and that is that the very things that the devil attacks are also the things that the Lord um, uses to overthrow the devil. Now let me let me just kind of say that again and see and because I I don't know I don't understand it well enough to actually to be able to teach it well so I'm just I'm I'm walking on the edge of what I know here but I would really I think this is important so I want to I I do want to know more and that is that the the thing that the devil attacks is precisely the thing that the Lord uses to overthrow him so that this so that faith hope and love these three abide they stand and it and and they are those things which which overthrow the devil in fact maybe the best and i'll just i think i have this on the next slide so i'll just go to it the next uh the 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 text for spiritual warfare that introduces the idea of spiritual warfare is ephesians chapter six where paul says look we're, we're fighting we're wrestling we we're doing war not against flesh and blood. And remember what Paul goes on to say after this. He says, you have the sword, whoops, that's the wrong thing to draw with. You have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, so that the, so that the thing, and this is the chief point of spiritual warfare, that the devil is attacking the Word of God. But what is it that overthrows the devil? Nothing other than the Word of God. So remember the serpent, or sorry, the remember the um, the birds who came to pick up the seed. What is the seed? The seed is the word of God, and the devil precisely attacks the word which overthrows him. So in regards to the idea of spiritual warfare, we're going to press on that a little bit. Saint Paul says uh, here at the end of Ephesians, finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Notice His might, not our might. Be strong in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers in this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And having done it, Paul continues, and having done all, stand, put on the whole armor so that you can withstand. So the key purpose of all this is so that we can stand and precisely, in fact, so that we can stand in our vocations where God has placed us. That's what Paul was talking about, about previously. Now, I want to highlight for you guys in this particular text, I mean, we see here who we do fight against. Paul has this long list of the demonic realm. We fight against rulers. We fight against authorities. We fight against the cosmic powers this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So this is who our battle is against. But I want to highlight who our battle is not against. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So that we as Christians are not authorized to do battle with our neighbor. That is not who our fight is against. Now this has to do with what we're talking about in regards to love. Look, who does Jesus say to love? 
He says, if you love your friends, you're just like the pagans. They love the friends. Everybody loves the people that love them back. Jesus says you have to love your enemies. In other words, the Christian is not authorized to declare war against other people because our battle is against the devil and the demons and so forth. So we don't do battle against flesh and blood. We do battle for flesh and blood. In fact, every person that you have ever met, even the worst of enemies, even the people who treat you the worst, et cetera, et cetera, these people are not, you, you are not authorized to hate them, but in fact, you are commanded to love them and to know about them. What? I mean, what do we know about every person? This is just kind of how we deal with one another. Sure. It's, it's really nice. But we have to, um, uh, but we have to, we think of everyone else as created by God. And this is a little bit of a rabbit hole, but it's, it's nice to remember this, that everyone is God's creatures, that everyone is a sinner, including me, that everyone is a, is a brother of Jesus according to the incarna incarnation. So according to the incarnation, th that Jesus is my brother. And that Jesus has died for every person, so that every person is died for by Jesus. And so that I know these four things about, in fact, let's put a fifth, that, that they will also be resurrected. So that I am, I am treating every person according to these things. Now, a thing, uh, a, a note came up in the chat uh, over here, and it says, well, what about just war? Does that mean that every just war is um is wrong that we can't declare war against anybody else and the answer is no as this is how so spiritual warfare is talking about our christian life uh and so there's slightly different questions about how we're acting as christians versus how we're acting for example as citizens and rulers and stuff like this so this is especially in the vocation of christian can a christian be a soldier can there be just wars indeed but uh uh, uh, nations are not doing spiritual warfare. Christian, this is talking about the Christian church doing spiritual warfare. Yeah. So, uh, so here we have the basis of spiritual warfare and good for the Christian to know that we are uh, engaged in the spiritual warfare. This place, Ephesians 6, is the most famous. But look at how Paul talks. And here's where I really want to hone in, really want to hone in uh, on, on the idea of hope. Look at this beautiful text. This is at the end of First Thessalonians. Remembering again that First Thessalonians is is, prep, is probably the very uh, first New Testament letter written. So the first. So if you were so, just pause when this writing right here was finished, and say what scripture you would have the Old Testament and this letter. I mean, this is the this is the premier text. Of the, uh, of the New Testament. And, and here's what Paul says. Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love. What colors did we use for faith and love? For faith, no, we used, uh, we used uh, blue as hope. What did we use for faith? It's called faith is green. Whoops. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Now look at, how, look at Paul here, who, who, has, who has outlined our, our armor in terms of faith and love and hope. So that the very things, let me, let me just pause for just a second there and let's just kind of make sure that, we, that this kind of settles in. That the very thing that the devil attacks, our faith in God, our love for God and our love for the neighbor and our hope, not only for the good things in this life, for God's care and provision and blessings, but also, and most especially for the resurrection and the life to come, that those are the things the devil attacks, but, but the Lord has given those things to us to protect us. It's the picture of an ancient soldier who had his armor on, you know, and he had his helmet and he had his breastplate. He had a shield, he had a sword and so forth. And Paul says, you have, protecting your heart, you have faith and love, and protecting especially your head, you have hope. 
so that hope is shaping our thinking, shaping our reasoning, shaping our imagination. Hope is what's giving us this great protection. You see it here again? Oh, when I come back, my, my marks are gone. Ho whoops. And my settings are off. So that we have hope, we have faith, and we have love. For and why, he's going to continue. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake, and here by awake, Paul means alive <laughs> or asleep, dead, whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing, so that faith, love, and hope are our protection, our encouragement, our build, and our building up. This awake, by the way, this is, um, since we belong to the day, it's the theme that's kind of running all the way through here, St. Paul. And let me just kind of hone in on this, on this idea of soberness, because it's pretty important. I mean, it's one of the dangers I think it's probably one of the dangers that we have in time of quarantine. It's one of the dangers that uh, Lutherans are always tempted towards. That, that, you know, there's a, on the one hand, there's a sort of um, a teetotaling spirit that, uh, that gets into the church that says that any sort of alcohol is bad. And then you have the Lutheran reaction, which is any sort of alcohol is good. <laughs> and that's, that's wrong. The Bible is often and always talking about sobriety. Now, it doesn't just mean, by the way, to not be drunk. I mean, you could be stone cold drunk, wait, stone cold sober, and still not be sober, what Paul's talking about. In other words, sobriety is a state of mind that has to do with spiritual alertness. In fact, this idea of being alert oftentimes has to do with our prayers. It has to do with it has to do with listening and praying. And, and so we're, we're, the, the picture is of a, like a night watchman. Of a, of, it's, it, the picture is one of these soldiers that would stand on the wall uh, of, the Roman, of the Roman Empire. And here's the empire back here. And here people are going to be attacking this way. But they don't attack during the day. They attack at night. And so I'm standing there on the wall. And I'm listening for the people sneaking up. In, in, at night. And then when they sneak up at night, I'm going to sound the alarm and say, hey, let's come and fight here. So I'm, I'm listening for the enemy's attack and I'm going to call in reinforcements. That's the, that's the picture of spiritual alertness that Paul is using here. And so where do we stand? We stand in, in the place where the Lord has called us. We stand in our homes and our churches and our neighborhoods, and we're listening for, we're paying attention to how the devil is attacking our family and our friends and our church. We're paying attention to that, and then we're calling in reinforcements. So sobriety doesn't, doesn't mean just not drinking a bunch of beer, although if you're drunk with beer, it's impossible to be sober. So it's not less than that, but it's more than that. It is, an, it is sort of an alertness. And it's an alertness that's marked with by faith, by a trust in the Lord's word, by a love for the neighbor, and by hope. So that, so that we have this hope, we have this confidence, and, and, it, and it is protecting us. Now let me hone in on one more word, and then we're going to pause for questions. So as you have questions, now is a good time uh, to send them over in the chat. But I want to I pick up on this particular word in this passage, and that is the word salvation. The helmet of the hope of salvation. Now remember, hope has to do with the future. And in a lot of ways, we already have salvation. I mean, this is one of the great truths when we look at, for example, the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And he says, whoever believes in me has eternal life. Not, it's not will have. That's, that's not what Jesus says. He says, no, no, you have eternal life right now so that our salvation, the forgiveness of sins, is a present reality. And yet there is still salvation that is yet future for us so that we have everything now in Christ, but that there is something that we are still waiting for. In fact, there's a lot of things. That we, there's, there's, so there's still some waiting that's happening. 
And so that, so, so that we say, are we saved? And the answer is, well, yes, we're saved. We have salvation, but we're waiting for salvation too. We're waiting for, the, for our sinful flesh to be taken away from us. We're waiting to see God face to face. We're waiting for the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. We're waiting for, uh, for the Lord Jesus to come back and to bring about his physical manifestation. And it comes up again twice. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that on the judgment day, what, is, what does the Lord have for us? On the judgment day, it's not wrath, but rather salvation through Jesus Christ. How? Because he died for us so that whether we're alive or we're the, we're the quick of the dead, we live with him. So encourage one another and build one another up. So that this idea that the Lord has given everything for us and that the Lord has more to give in his goodness, it protects our minds. Now, the other thing to note is that when we don't have that hope, then our minds are open to corruption. Our minds are open to demonic influence. As the devil caught, and, and this is, an interesting sort of spiritual phenomenon, but something important to think about is that as our hope is diminished, both our, our godly reasonable hope in this life and also our sure and confident hope in the resurrection, as that is diminished in our minds, now our minds are less protected. Now our minds are open to the influence of, of the devil and the demons. And so, so we want to continue to, to shore up our hope one of the things we're going to look at next, look at the time, probably not today. One of the things we're going to look at next week or the week after is, is what our hope is based on and how our hope comes. It's a Trinitarian thing. It's the, it's the work of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through the Word. And, and we'll kind of unfold the scriptures about that. But at the Lord, as the Lord strengthens our hope, he, he protects our minds uh, that, that are there. And so this is, I think, hope... I, I'm hoping that this helps kind of unfold the place of hope in spiritual warfare. Okay. Um, I got one more passage to show you, but let's pause there and see what questions we've got. David, how's it going over there in the chat? Going great. Ruth points out, uh, she brings up a hymn. This is, I think, goes back to the Ephesians text. She's reminded of stand up, stand up for Jesus. And uh, verse three says, stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor and watching unto prayer where duty calls or danger be never wanting there. Nice. No, that's uh, so th there's always this um, when it comes to the picture of spiritual warfare. Uh, there's always this. There's the negative side and the, and the positive side. And the negative side is what we don't trust in. So we got to go to the Psalms and we see things like trust not in princes. In fact, how about that? We're commanded to, not only does the Bible tell us what, what we are supposed to trust in, or better, who we're supposed to trust, it also tells us who's, who we're not supposed to trust. Don't trust princes, don't trust war horses, don't trust power, don't trust wealth, don't trust mammon, don't trust, you know, there's all these things that are not trustworthy, that we're tempted constantly to put our trust in. So we don't trust that. Our trust is not in these things. When it comes to spiritual warfare, our trust is in the Lord. And, and, his, and the power of his might. And, that's, uh, and so we stand as Christian soldiers. We, we don't march, we stand in the strength, not, not in our own strength, not in our own righteousness. Not, it's not a hope in ourselves, but in, in the Lord and his word. Fantastic. And then with the most recent topic, uh, here we have a, a question from Elizabeth uh, regarding the, the coming salvation. Uh, they're reminded of a passage you've, you've quoted before. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Yeah, that's how when Jesus... See, oh, I think it goes oh, on, I'm sorry. Oh, sure. No, no, that's good. When we see these attacks from the devil, how encouraging is it to know that it is a reminder that our Savior is coming soon to save us? That's fantastic. No, that's right. So spiritual, Jesus is giving us spiritual eyes in that text. And he says, when you see all these things happening, wars and rumors of wars and, and all the stars falling out of the sky and everything, what are we supposed to do? We're not running away, but we're, we lift up our eyes knowing that the one who's coming back is the one who died for us on the cross. 
So are, are we, can you imagine? So everybody thinks the world is going to end. I mean, even the atheists think that one day the world is going to end and they think it's going to end, I don't know, probably by the sun exploding or maybe before that by you know, global warming is going to bring an extinct, a great extinction event or something like this. They all think that, so everybody thinks the world is going to end. But, but, every, but the secular picture of the end of the world is despair, you know? So when the world ends, what are you going to do? You're just going to run for it. Or like, you know, shoot an actor in a missile to try to explode the comet or something like this. I mean, that's, the, you know, it's the human ingenuity or despair. Those are the only two options. But we know that the, we know that the end of the world is a wedding. Can you just think about that? Like, the hope that the young man and young woman have for their wedding day, that great, there's just this it's kind of the longing for that, the joy of that day. That that's how the Bible teaches us to think of the last day. The end of the world as we know it is, is a, is a wedding. The bride of Christ and his, his church being, being joined to Christ, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. This is, Fantastic. So we have this hope for the we have this hope for the end, this hope for the last day. It's incredible. That's a great point. We also have a question for Pastor Warner if he wants to jump back on. Uh, the question is, how do I witness to the many many Catholics in my life? That's fantastic. Is pa is Pastor Warner still hanging around? Do we know if he's here? Yeah, Pastor Warner, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um... First of all, remember what uh, remember what uh, Pastor Wolfmuller said about um, we are not here to fight with people. We don't here to fight with flesh and blood. Um, you know, love them. You you want to you want to witness to your Catholic friends, love them, and then talk to them about Jesus. Um, and you know, it's not a project to um, for you to convince them that they're wrong and that you're right and that, that they need to come to your side, but rather um, witness to them about Christ and his love and, and, and the confidence and the hope and, and you know, shower them with, with uh, the joy of, of the pure gospel. And, and it's not any different for anyone else, but I think in particular, especially given uh, not that recent history in much of the world, it's really easy for us to think about in, in antagonistic terms, um, but uh, no, um, there, uh, there are errors in the Catholic Church. Um, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think that was true, but, but I love Catholics, and uh, if I couldn't love Catholics, I'd be a terrible, I may be not the greatest missionary in the world in the first place, but if I can't love Catholics, um, I better go find something else to do, and I think that's true for everybody. I, my picture is, so when we confess in the catechism that the Holy Spirit is calling, gathering, enlightening, and sanctifying the whole Christian church on earth, is that you have, you have this, it's, the, it's like the church is a boat, and the people are the fish, and some people are hooked, some people are not yet hooked, some people are hooked, and some people are on the boat. Now, this is my own imagination, but the Lutherans are the fish that are on the boat, and like a, a bunch of stupid fish we're trying to flop off but anyway they, we're on the boat but the holy spirit has hooked everybody else you know our catholic friends our evangelical friends our reformed friends they're hooked and they and the holy spirit is gathering them together to the truth and some might die on the line not in the boat yet and have to be dragged in and in death uh but to, the the holy spirit is doing that work already that's what we confess there that the holy spirit is calling gathering enlightening and sanctifying the whole christian church on earth he's doing that work with us and he's doing that work with all christians and so that gives us confidence to know that now it's not us that the lord is doing that and so our job is i think to like pastor warner said we're looking for opportunities to um to love to serve to bless to to speak clearly the joy that we have in christ and to rejoice also in the in the debates because it's precisely in the debates that our own clarity comes clear. Wait a minute. That our own confession becomes clear. That we, we, we realize, oh, now how do we think of Mary? Or how does love relate to faith? 
How is justification by grace through faith alone, apart from works and so forth? So those debates and those conversations press us closer to the scriptures, which is a blessing also for us. So to see that the Lord uses those opportunities to speak to other people of different confessions or different faiths or no faith at all, the Lord uses those occasions also to bless us. So, um, so the Lord is doing this work, and we pray that he's also doing it with us. This is the point, that he's gathering us. He's gathering us. The Holy Spirit's doing it. Um, David, uh, this question is a good question about how do we deal with sin against us. Do you, do you mind? Um, I think we could take that on. Yeah. Um, sorry, there's a lot coming in, so I have to scroll back to it. Do I have it here? I think, do I? Do I, I tried to yeah, copy and paste it and send it uh, to you. I would love to hear Pastor Wolf from the talk more about how we should respond when we are sinned against, perhaps especially our response to anger. Um, a family members struggle with this. I struggle with it too. Learning more about this from a spiritual perspective would be helpful. Let's, uh, let's, t- let's take up the topics. That sound good? Um, can I do a whiteboard? You guys have a whiteboard there? Can you see it? Yeah, we got a whiteboard. Um, okay. So, so, so here's the basic idea is that Jesus says love. Okay, I got it. Love. But then someone comes, here I am with the command of love, but someone comes and they, and they sin against me. That's me there. And here's them. <laughs> so here I am and I'm sinned against. Blam. And what happens is that now I'm, I'm angry. That's always my first response. And so I'm angry against them. And what does that mean? When I'm angry, that means, well, I know I'm supposed to love everybody, but that guy's not everybody. I know I'm supposed to love my neighbor, but this guy over here, he's off the neighbor list. Boom. I don't have to love him. And so what, so the, so the spiritual phenomenon, and it's just, I mean, in fact, some of the Some of the best stuff is just to recognize this. The spiritual phenomenon is that if I'm angry with that person, then I'm saying that they're a not neighbor. To put maybe, to put other language on it, is that that anger is this, it's justified lovelessness, justified not loving. And this word justified, I use on purpose. Because it, we've, justification is a legal term, and justification is our salvation, that we stand justified before the Lord. But the danger is we're always trying to justify ourselves. Our flesh is always trying to justify ourselves and justify our own actions. In other words, I made an excuse for not loving this person, and why? They sinned against me, so they don't deserve it. As if that's the question. As if Jesus said, love the people that deserve it. If that was the case, then we maybe would have only a couple of people that we would love, but certainly the Lord would not love us. So, so that we go back to the scriptures and we see that when the Lord tells us about love, he specifically connects it to loving our enemy. Now here's, so here's what happens. And, the, and, and this cycle is oftentimes in some of the closest relationships. So we see this often in families. I'm sinned against, so I get angry, so I don't love this person. And the result is I sin against them. Maybe by neglect, maybe, maybe by not talking to them, maybe by treating them coldly or whatever. I sin against them, and then what happens now? They get angry, and then they sin back against me because this is what happens. And so what hap- my conscience becomes, becomes hardened to them. In fact, one of the pictures that we can have of the hardened conscience is that the, so the anger is like a, a shot of Novocaine to the conscience. So remember when you go to the dentist and he says, okay, I'm going to give you a shot. And he pulls out this, this big four inch needle. And, oh man, I do not like this, by the way, but he gives you this shot. And now all of a sudden you're numb in that particular spot. Well, if you could think of your conscience this way, and here's one neighbor, here's another neighbor, and here's my neighbors and my conscience. And when someone sins against me, what happens is that I get a little spot of numbness in the conscience. And now I don't feel like I need to love that person. I don't, that, my conscience doesn't bother me if I don't treat that person right. So my conscience isn't helping me to love them, but in fact, 
sin now in the hardness of the conscience is, is, uh, is let loose. And the result is this start, now this starts to go back and forth, back and forth. I sin against you, you sin against me. You, and then at some point you go from anger to an, being an enemy. And then you go from and being an enemy to then what, what Hebrews talks about is bitterness. So that bitterness comes in. And now, not only am I just not loving, now I'm actively sinning against this person. Now I actively desire this person's hurt and so forth and so on. So this is the kind of cycle that the devil wants to get us in. And this is his attack on love. Now, what cuts this off? I mean, is, is specifically what the Lord Jesus says about anger. So, so that there's, there's instructions in the Bible about anger. For example, Paul says in Ephesians, he says, be angry, but do not sin. And Jesus says, so these are the two texts that we're going to have to wrestle with. Jesus says, if you're angry with your brother, you've murdered them. So anger is murder. So now, how, so how do we reconcile those two particular texts? That is, is, is anger, is it possible to ang be angry and not sin? Or is anger always, um, is anger always uh, going to be a particular sin? And here I think is the, is the thing that we want to be careful for. When we're talking about a righteous anger, we're talking about an anger of office, not an anger of person. So what's the difference? If I'm a dad and the kids sin or do something wrong or something foolish, then I should rightly be angry with them and I should exercise that anger in a measured, careful way and say to the kids, okay, now you can't do this or you have to do that or whatever. But I'm not angry with them personally. That's when things get really bad. When I think that my kid's misbehavior is some sort of personal affront to me, and now I'm going to take it out on them. No, no, no. Then the anger is, if the anger is an anger of person, then it's serving the self. If the anger is an anger of office, it's serving the neighbor. If I'm a, let's say I'm a judge, and here comes the, someone who stands before me, uh, someone who's committed a crime, and I say to them, okay, now you have to go do two hour, 20 hours, 200 hours of community service. I'm not yelling at them vehemently. I'm just simply exercising that anger of office for the sake of love for them and for, and for, my, for my neighbor. If I start railing them as if they have offended me personally, then my anger has become a sin. So that, so that there's a way that we can be rightly angry according to our office. That's the careful thing. But, not, but we never are authorized to be angry according to our person. That's when it gets into sin. And so we have to recognize that this anger is a person, is murder in the eyes of God and leads to murder in the eyes of man. So that Jesus says, if this happens, if you're sinned against, you know what to do. So our response, the Christian response to being sinned against, let's see if I can make a little bit of room here. The, the Christian response to being sinned against is not the response of anger, but rather, what does Jesus say? He says, love. So when someone sins against me, I'm, I'm under the obligation of my Lord Jesus Christ to love them. And there's no question about it. There's no uncertainty about this. There's no wondering about this. When I'm sinned against, my calling as a Christian is to love. Now, people say, well, look, Pastor, okay, that's fine, but I, that's hard. I don't do that. I'm sinned against all the time, and I don't react in love. Well, right. <laughs> I mean, love is always going to condemn us. But at least we know a couple of things. Number one, we know what we should do. <laughs> I mean, there's no, uh, there's no like lack of clarity on what we ought to do. The law is clear. We should love those who sin against us. And then number two, when we don't, then we repent of it. I mean, how, how often can we simply come to the Lord and say, Lord, you've, you've given me this enemy, this person that hates me, this person that sinned against me, and you've told me to love them, and I haven't, and I've failed, so please forgive me. Um, 
please restore me. Please give me your Holy Spirit so that I can begin to love them and begin to serve them. Teach me how. So that this, this call to love our enemy is always calling us to humility and to repentance uh, and to faith in Christ, who is the only one who perfectly loved his enemies. So, um, yeah, so hopefully that's helpful. That's a, it's, um, I think that gets to the question, oh, now, and we're at the end again. This is yeah, so- you answered a lot of questions along the way in that discussion as well. Perfect. There's not a lot of time, but quickly, the analogy about the boat – uh, and the, the fish in the boat and we're yeah, periodically yeah, yeah. flopping around trying to get out of the boat. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's right. it's, it's possible. There's a couple questions in here about that. Maybe people haven't heard that analogy. Do you have a couple minutes to expand on that analogy? Yeah. I don't know if I've ever taught it, but it's, 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 uh, it's just in my mind too, because one of the things is we, so we often think of evangelism as our, like we're the ones out there fishing, uh, go and I'll, I'll call, I will make you fishers of men. We see here, Jesus calling Peter, and so we think now everyone's going to be a fisher of men. But God be praised that Peter and, and the scriptures, those the apostles and the prophets are fishing and the Holy Spirit is using them as the fishermen to draw us in. And it's, it's better to think of ourselves as the fish that are caught um, and that are dragged in. So Jesus tells the parable of the net. In fact, on in Matthew 13, it's one of the parables of the kingdom. So the Lord is drawing us drawing us in. So we rejoice in this, that the Lord is the one who's dragging us. Uh, and we should just rejoice. I think before we start thinking about how we need to go out there and fish, it's best for us to reflect on the fact that we are fished <laughs> or however you say, we are caught. We are netted. We are hooked that Jesus has us. Uh, and that's where our joy comes from. And then we rejoice that the Lord is not dragging us into his boat alone, but he's dragging everyone. In fact, how about this, that, that everyone that we care about, that we love, that we hope that would become a Christian, that we hope that would believe in Jesus, Jesus also has that hope. And par- part of our understanding of universal grace, I, wanted, I need to study this a little bit more. I was reading some, an old theologian who was talking about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, because we normally think universal grace means that Christ died for everyone, but the old theologian says it's more than that. We also confess that the Holy Spirit is working in every person's heart and mind and conscience to draw them to Christ through the word. So that Jesus loves the people that you love and desires their salvation as you do, in fact, more than you do. And so there's a lot of hope in that, that Jesus, that, that Jesus is doing his work. He's not just, you know, he... He's not quarantined at the right hand of the God, the Father. He's there working and doing all these things for us. Good? Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of questions here that I think would be great for future topics, but I don't, unfortunately, I don't think we have time right now. Well, let's, we'll, capture, we'll capture the chat, and then there's one more thing to say about spiritual warfare, Romans chapter 5. We'll start next week with that, and then we want to make this distinction between um, the source of hope, the object of hope, and the act of hoping. So if you think of hope like there's a foundation of hope that we rest on, and then there's the, the thing that we hope for, and then there's the, there's the act of hoping, and the Bible talks about all three of those things. It, it mostly, we would think that hope mostly would be directed towards the object, like what is it that I'm hoping for? But more than that, hope is in the scriptures founded on God, who God is and what he's promised and what he's done. So the object of hope is perhaps even more important than the object of hope. And so we'll make some of those distinctions and press that out a little bit as well. So thanks again, everyone, for being here, for being part of the chat. We'll capture that chat, we'll, and we'll, we'll try to start with it next week. If you have any other thoughts or questions, um, you can send those to me. I'm really so honored that you guys are all here for part of this. Invite your, if you're enjoying this, invite your friends, people from church, and invite your pastors. If, any, if anybody has any um, anyone that they want to hear from, let me know and we can have them on. How cool was that to hear from Pastor Warner? So we can hear from anybody anywhere in the world with this whole thing. So that'll be great. Um, and, and thanks again. We'll record, we'll put the video up on, uh, on the websites, the church website, St. Paul, and also on my YouTube channel. So uh, you can find this later and all the notes are still available as well. I think that's it. Let's, let's end with a prayer. Lord, we pray that you would, continue to protect us against the devil, 
against his attack on our faith and our love and our hope in you and your promises, that we would abide safely protected in these things with the breastplate of faith and hope, with the helmet of, with the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope, that you would keep us safe until we arrive at last in hope fulfilled, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. We pray that you would bless and keep in your hope all those who are part of the study uh, and their families and friends, that you would keep us all safe during this pandemic and that you would use us to bless one another and our neighbors in your name. For we ask all these things through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks, David, for, for helping host. And thanks, everyone, for being part of it. Uh, Lord's peace be with you and see you next week. Wow.